Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my peers and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Hiten Sanpal. Hiten is the CEO of Rise Robotics and the former president of Electric Sheep. Hiten, welcome to the pod. Spencer, thank you for having me. We've been talking about doing this for some time, and I'm glad, and I'm glad we're finally able to make it happen. Me too, buddy. I'm really happy. Um, you've been a friend and a mentor and uh, just, just a good person all around for me to know for a while now. Um, I'm grateful to have you on the podcast as well. Do you flatter all your guests like this? I mean, just the ones I've known for a while and have rapport with. <laughs> um, thank you. Those are kind words, and I'm, I'm untouched. So I guess one of the things I like to ask my guests is, um, how did you get into robotics? Like, what, what brought you down this path? Um, when was the moment where you, you decided to turn left, as it were? That's a really funny and in, uh, it's, a, it's a funny and very interesting story. Um, so I must have been... This is probably first grade. So I must have been like uh, six, seven years old. And uh, we uh, grew up in Calcutta, India. But in this particular case, during this time in my life, we were in a smaller town. um, And we didn't have a TV. And uh, so just play on with the kids in the alley behind our house. And one day, a whole bunch of kids in the middle of our game just got up and ran and said, Hey, we're gonna go watch this show, and uh, I was like, "What show?" As we were kind of all running towards this kid's house, and they said, "It's Johnny Sacco and the Flying Robot," <laughs> and I'm like, "What's that? I've never heard of the show before." I haven't either. <laughs> and so yeah, it was this Japanese show, I think, and uh, so we ran in, and you know, there was this really small black and white TV, and a whole bunch of kids huddled around the the thing. And I was really fascinated. It was this kid, Johnny Sacco, and he had a flying robot. <laughs> and uh, and looking back now, it's really entertaining how they managed to get a, well, I think it was a 30-minute show, but they probably only had to do maybe 10 uh, minutes of shooting because a lot of the scenes were the robot arming itself, right? So it'd be like the robot getting ready to take off, and then they'd show the jets starting, and it takes some time, and the robot would start moving up, and they would show you these action shots of the robot going through the clouds. And then when it was time for the robot to attack, the robot had missiles coming out of its fingers. So it would hold up its arms, and then the fingers would load one at a time, and you hear the sound, and they would play this multiple times <laughs> in that episode. But as a, as a, Recycling as a that footage. That's right. As a six- or seven-year-old, I was like, this is, this is the bomb. This is the best. And... Uh, so I, I got really into the show, and at some point, I decided I wanted to get into robotics. Um, and I remember in second grade, I went up to a friend, and we were sharing secrets with each other. And he said some secret to me. I don't remember what it was. And he was like, do you have a secret you want to share? And I said, yes, I'm going to build a flying robot. You know, And he was like, wow, that's so cool. Uh, I haven't built a flying robot yet. But uh, that was kind of the start of my journey to getting into robotics. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Yeah, um, I've sort of worked on a couple drones, but, like, not enough that I would say I've actually built a flying robot. Like, we've done, like, systems engineering and design studies. Uh, but, yeah, that's sweet. Well, how old were you when you built your first robot? So I tried a, a bunch of different electronic things. So, like, what happened is I was very fortunate as a kid in India to have some family in the United States. And when they'd come visit, they'd bring toys from the U.S. And one of the first toys that I got from the U.S. that was fascinating was a Lego kit. And this was one of the early space series that Lego had come out with. And so I had hours of fun building it, and I started to develop mechanical intuition about how things work together. And then eventually I got my hands on a Technic kit, and that was even more fun because it had gearboxes and motors and it was, it was just really exciting learning about those things. And separately, 
I was learning coding in school and working on some electronic stuff myself, but I never got the chance to put all three of those things together. And it wasn't until undergraduate that my senior project, which I did with a friend of mine, Rami Nino, uh, we built a chess playing robot. And it was cool. more of it, yeah, this was more of an integration project. So we, I used the crafty chess engine, which was open source. I used Xboard, which was an X viewer so I could debug what was going on. We built a board that connected to uh, the PC uh, using an RS-232 serial port. Uh, these were popular back then. Of course, they've all but disappeared now. And for the mechanism, Rami, who was more the mechanical engineer on the project, took two old printers and glued <laughs> the dot matrix printers and attached and connected awesome. the two arms to make like an X, uh, Y plotter. And then he made a gripper that would pick these pieces up. And that was, uh, quote unquote, the first robot. That's right. And just moved like, a, you know, X, Y plotter and was picking up pieces and moving around. And we had to do a lot of hacks to make this thing work. That's impressive for a first one. I mean, it sounds like you integrated. How long did it take you to build that? Like, was that a whole year, I'm imagining? Yeah, about a year. Awesome. I didn't mean to cut, cut you off, but I was... Yeah, it took about a year. It was uh, a lot of fun, actually. Uh, I ran into several problems because the cameras at the time were nowhere like the cameras of today. So we had a webcam, uh, and this was the late 90s, and so... The webcams had spherical distortion, and they didn't really have very high resolution, and the color was off. And um, so I had to do a lot of image processing, but there were, it was very brittle image processing. I had to do, you know, regulate the brightness, uh, try to find the edges of the pieces. And actually, I wasn't successful in finding white pieces on white squares and ah, black pieces brutal. on black squares. Yeah, so what I ended up doing is that same set had a uh, set of checker pieces so you could play checkers. And uh, I ended up, and the checker pieces were red and black. And so nice. I ended up doing the back, the black pieces at the bottom of the white chess pieces so that they would stand out on a white square. And then I ended up putting the red checker pieces on the bottom of the, the black pieces so the black pieces would stand out. And that's how I used to determine if there was a piece in a particular square. but. The camera resolution was so bad that I could not identify <laughs> the pieces uh, just by looking at them. And so I made an educated guess that the board started off correctly with the pieces in the correct position. So you just tracked them. <laughs> like, yeah. And I just tracked them, that's, awesome. that's right, to figure out where the pieces were. Um, I actually had a faculty member pull me aside after I did the demo to the faculty and a bunch of students. They were like, this is the best project I've seen and I've been teaching this university for 20 years. It was quite flattering to hear, um, but ultimately it was really a hack. It was like, a, you know, maybe a grad school project. Couldn't scale. We, I don't even think we could build a second one of those without it being completely different. <laughs> you probably want it to be different, though, because I bet you learned lessons along the way. That's right. It was actually quite the mess. Um, but it was, it was exciting to work on it. And just, uh, you know, the confidence you get from building something of any significant complexity, uh, that was very much part of the, the, the project. It was, it, was, it was great fun. That's awesome. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Yeah, Rise Robotics is just, I'm just in awe at uh, what the company did, you know, from the outside. Well, now what we do, right? Um, hydraulics has been around for so long. Like, it's almost ubiquitous, right? And there are these um, electric actuators, ball screws, and so on and so forth that are trying to replace hydraulics, but it's all in the fringes. And... Rise has just invented this really cool linear actuator that's driven by belts, which has higher speed than hydraulics, can match the stroke length of hydraulics, which other electric technologies can't, and uh, is roughly four times as efficient. So I was reading somewhere that the average, if you did the efficiency analysis on 
all the hydraulics out there. On average, they're 20% efficient. I think the ones that are mobile, so used on machines, uh, there's a little bit more effort put into making them more efficient, so they're in the 30%. And rise actuators are 80% efficient. And, nice. And it, yeah, that's 80% from you know power coming out of battery to motion, and also motion back to battery. So they regenerate, which is I mean, just incredibly incredible. clever. Yeah. Um, so someone I've worked with for a long time at iRobot uh, is a gentleman by the name of Tyson Sawyer, and he joined Rise as the first employee after the four co-founders. Cool. He told me about this company he was joining, and uh, I didn't believe him. I said, this is, I don't think this is possible. And he said, you need to read the patent. And so I went and read the patent. I'm like, oh, wow, there's something here. And so, uh, so after that, you know, nothing much happened, and eventually, I re I wanted to understand what was happening at Rice, so I connected with the founders, visited Tyson, invited me over, had a chance to look at their stuff, and they were, were really cool. Um, and we had conversations, and there really wasn't a fit. And then after I left, um, Aaron uh, Acosta, the CEO of Rise, and I kept uh, bumping into each other at investment conferences. And at some point, he heard that I was doing consulting and said, hey, why don't you join as a consultant? And I became uh, a CEO coach, helping him to get his product out to market faster. That was the goal. Um, and then after six months, he asked me if I would join as CEO. And what I didn't realize is over those six months, there was an extended interview happening where I'd help him with a few things. And he'd say, OK, can you turn that into a slide deck? And I turn it into a slide deck. And then he'd say, can you present that to the board? And then I presented to the board, and the board was also evaluating me, and uh, and that turned into me joining full time as CEO. Do you think it was intentional on their part at that point, or like it turned into that? Because I, I'm wondering, you know, like did they mean to? Were you a candidate from the start? I think I became one in that process. Um, I knew one of the board members, and they said that uh, had they been looking for a CEO, I would have fit the profile. Um, they wanted someone that had, uh, you know led a smaller company before, understood what it, product market fit, what it takes to get products out to market, had done things at scale, uh, were comfortable in the electrical, mechanical, software, or systems domain. Um, and so I had previously had a CEO uh, opportunity at uh, Mobot uh, in Dallas, uh, which was fun. I learned a lot. Um, and it sort of prepared me for this opportunity at Rise. So ready to go, having been through that, understanding what it takes to work with the board. Of course, at iRobot, I reported into the executive team when I was running programs. Um, but a board is a little different because um, you have so much latitude, um, and the board is really there to help you, and uh, they're really on your team. It, when it's working well, and it's working really well at Rise, I nice. feel like they're in my corner. Uh, I'm getting a lot of coaching. I'm getting advice. I'm getting suggestions. I'm getting options. I'm getting ideas. Um, and I feel, like I feel like I'm growing. Yes, I'm adding value to Rise, but there are so many smart people around me that uh, I'm also growing, which is, is really exciting. It's really exciting. That's awesome. And it's, it's a brilliant design, and I've read the patents as well. And, um, you know, it's, I'm a huge fan of using belts in that way. I mean, I think the fact that you guys um, mimicked the hydraulic form factor is a good decision for going after some of the, um, you know, like, electrification efforts on companies like Caterpillar and Komatsu and Case New Holland and, and, you know, basically people building big mining and construction shovels, more construction than mining with hydraulics, let's be honest. But, you know, it's, um, it's an awesome product. I mean, when we um, started with our tension dynamics actuator, I had kind of a similar journey in that at first I was like, this is ridiculous. We're not going to make a new type of linear actuator. Like, you know, I don't have time for this. Like I, I've got other stuff I'm doing. And my co-founders were like, oh, come on, you know, like, uh, you know, take a look at it. And so I, I came in to their, uh, their shop. And when I came in the second time, they were assembling a prototype as I walked in the door and like tightening the bolts on it. And I saw it. I'm like, OK, this actually works, you know. Well, shit. <laughs> so I um, that's when I kind of became interested. I was like, OK, I, this is novel. It's different. Um, our design is different from yours. It doesn't mimic the profile of a hydraulic cylinder, so it's not probably as good for retrofits as yours is, but it's got a better extended to compressed ratio. Like it can get really small as opposed to how wide it gets because it's kind of similar to a scissor jack. And so 
I think it's just different. I think they're different products for different niches, but both following a similar principle, which is that, you know, if you do clever stuff with pulleys and, and drums and mechanical advantage and electric motors, you know, you can create a pretty awesome linear actuator. And so that's, that's the common ground, I think. Yeah. Is there a name for your actuator? Like, do you have a, uh, or should I just call it the tension dynamics actually? That's what we're calling it at this point. I mean, we, we don't have a name yet. We're, we're like six weeks out of stealth at the time we're recording this. It'll be longer by the time the episode airs. Yeah, so I was having a conversation with uh, a couple of folks at Rise about your actuator. And oh, cool. They found it exciting that we're working on this stuff. And uh, immediately they identified that one of the advantages of what you're doing is a lightweight. And so it's a natural for space applications, but it's also natural for anywhere where weight is is key. So it's, it's cool. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And I'm glad we're, we're on your guys' radar. And, you know, I, I think there's a mutual respect there. I mean, you're certainly on ours too, but, you know, in a way where there's, there's only admiration. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think uh, anything we can do to improve the state of the art, right, in terms of efficiency or effectiveness, speed, I mean, all of those things uh, just benefit a lot of other people. So, you know, anything that someone wants to buy, you know, you're making an impact. Yeah, hundred percent. Do you think the reason no one's been doing these kind of designs up until recently is just materials deficits? Like, you know, like maybe not deficits, but like just recent advances in material science is what's enabled some of this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And it'd be interesting to see what other industry exploding caused this to happen. But the belts that uh, Rise uses are fairly new. They've been around, around for a couple of decades only. Um, and I think we, we discussed earlier how they first made their appearance in elevators, where you had to do these. Uh, so for regular or, or standard or traditional elevators, you had to uh, change the steel cable because there was steel on steel friction in the drums. Um, and you have to deal with that, and then also they were exposed to the environment, so eventually there was some rusting. But with these poly, with these polyurethane belts that in, uh, encapsulate uh, steel rope, you don't have any of that. You also don't have to deal with uh, steel on steel friction, and these belts really last the life of the building in the elevator market, which That's is awesome. huge, right? Wait, so you guys are using steel uh, reinforced polyurethane? I didn't realize that. Yes, steel That's reinforced awesome. polyurethane. Yep. We're using um, trend, so. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, and so I don't know what, and I mean, in, in many ways, except for the rubber part, it's kind of like a tire, right? So you've got this steel reinforcement, and then you've got a material on the outside that protects it. Um, when I go back and think about parallels, I think about batteries and internal combustion engines. So there's a point where I think we had cars with batteries and internal combustion engines at the same time very early on uh, when cars first came out. And it was incrementally easier to improve an internal combustion engine than it was to improve a battery. And it wasn't until much, so internal combustion engines sort of just rode this wave and they became more and more efficient and uh, delivered greater power and the packaging got better and people understood how to manufacture it and so on and so forth. And batteries sort of had a, would have a different curve. And it wasn't until we started to build smaller and portable devices that we started to get these nickel batteries. And then finally, laptops were the thing that I think pushed lithium ion into the mainstream. And then phones sort of really caused billions of dollars of investment to go into batteries. And so now batteries are at the point where you look at them and they have more capability than an internal combustion engine. Uh, motors have also gotten built during that time. And so things like cassette players and DVD, uh, uh, yeah, uh, VHS players. Laser and DVD <laughs> players. Yeah, laser <laughs> Hard <Metamax. discs>. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, so many of these formats uh, just, it seems like mechanisms, small mechanisms become really important. So I think motor technology has advanced as well. And so now you see this uh, emergence of, of batteries as being something that can finally replace the tone combustion engines. And I think these belts are like that as well. Uh, there was a time where they're just regular rope, right, and pulleys. And eventually those got replaced with hydraulics. And now that uh, the belt technology has sort of gotten to this level of performance, like you said, it's, it's all about the materials, that 
the Pooleys are making a comeback, and uh, and we just it's just it took a lot of work to package it into that form factor. Some of it was natural, and some of it took a fair bit of work. And our CTO Blake Sessions has been described by uh, other people as a generational genius. Uh, he's an MIT grad, and he put in a lot of work to get the tech here. Um, and then our other co-founder, Tomas Sepp, also a very, very strong engineer, uh, basically took a lot of the early work that Blake had done and built on that to get us to the point that we are today. That's awesome. Uh, and it's all new, and we have a ton of patents and cool stuff. Yeah, you guys have a super impressive patent portfolio for sure. So what are some of the things you see the Rise actuators going into? But really, any system that has hydraulics in it will eventually be replaced by a rise actuator. We call these we call our technology belt hydraulic, so uh, it's just a play on the word hydraulic, right? And it sort of flows very easily. Um, it, was an, it was a name that uh, Kyle, uh, one of our other co-founders, came up with. Um, and uh, when I first heard it, it just was like this. Just it just feels right, you know. Um, so our belt hydraulic actuators will end up replacing hydraulics everywhere. I think it's going to take time because of the cost curve, uh, but ultimately I see it going everywhere where there's hydraulics simply because uh, the actuator can do everything a hydraulic system can do um, and it has none of the disadvantages. So you're not leaking fluids, um, you don't have to wear um, PPE around it, especially if, when hydraulic fluids are under high pressure um, because of the increased productivity, your op your OPEX costs go down, right? Because you're taking less fuel, less electricity, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, and then, of course, the energy efficiency of the system. So that unlocks so many mobile applications. For example, uh, let me use one, which is like container handlers. So if you want to take a container handler and you want to make it, uh, t take one that's gas powered, and you'd like to convert one to electric, well, you're going to have to put a huge battery pack behind it. And that substantially increases the cost to the point that they're not affordable. So you wouldn't be able to make one of those systems and sell them. And not only that, if you have a bunch of these systems that are using inefficient hydraulic systems and you have these huge battery packs, well, there's only so many you can put in a location before you start to stress out the grid. And so if you're going to have these large electric industrial machines, not only do you need to have these huge battery packs, but then you need to have even bigger battery packs that you're trickle charging off the grid so that when you actually connect to those big batteries, you can charge quickly. <clears throat> so there's a lot of cost in switching to electric in all these machines. Um, but if you end up using a belt hydraulic actuator, then you get twice the runtime. So then you can either buy half the machines or you could even choose to have the size of the battery and every little bit of power that you remove on the edge, you end up needing to generate 3x less, right? Oh, that's interesting. You're talking belt hydraulic as opposed to electric hydraulic. Yes. Okay, that that's makes more sense. At first, I thought you just meant like, you know, belt hydraulic in general. I'm like, huh, I didn't realize you needed that big of a battery. And you're like, no, 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 wait. <laughs> so, yeah, that makes yeah. sense because you're skipping that efficiency loss when you convert electric to hydraulic and then going through those ORFI and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly, right? Because you're, uh, I mean, when you think about what's happening there, when you're taking electrical energy and converting it to hydraulic, well, you're taking um, electric potential energy, you're using it to turn uh, in, into roadway energy, then you're using that to push this really viscous liquid, you're compressing it, and then you're forcing that liquid through these narrow orifices, and stuff starts to get hot, and the liquid is viscous so that it doesn't leak around the seals, right? Yeah. And so that's now you need a radiator to cool it, and that's extra infrastructure that takes up space. It's unpleasant Absolutely. to be around. Like you mentioned PPE, because you know you could spring a leak and you're at like 5,000 PSI or whatever. Yeah, you could lose an eye or even a hand. It's just scary stuff. Um, in our system, if a belt breaks, then it's all contained inside the actuator. So you don't get to experience it outside. That's awesome. Yeah, so back to applications, really. The, the applications are limitless. Um, initially, though, the way we see sort of the adoption going um, is going to be driven by utilization and value. So our actuators are roughly 3x the cost at uh, 1,000 units, roughly. And then they're 1.5x the cost of hydraulics at 10,000 units. So there's a cost curve there. And so if they're just 
very, very cost conscious applications. We won't be able to break into that market until we have significant economies of scale. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But I can still think of, you know, at least on like the concept vehicle side, I, I can think of a lot of OEMs that would just adopt that to have it on their latest electrification effort, which is a foot in the door, which means that if you can break the economies of scale, you've already got a beachhead at those companies. So, I mean, at least yeah. that's what that's what I would think the mar- market monetization, market capture strategy might look like. If I'm I think so, yeah. I, I, yeah. All of that makes sense. Yeah, certainly we've got a lot of interest from folks that want to do a concept vehicle or a concept system that uh, they want to test and they want to see how well it does. Um, but I'll say that there are mainly two axes that I look at when I'm trying to think of, is this a suitable candidate market for us? And the first one is, what is the utilization of the system? And so if a system has high utilization, um, so like in a commercial application where you're using a piece of equipment over and over, um, then every little bit of productivity you get, and our actuators You're starting to pay back that CapEx with OpEx savings since you're not paying for the power. Yeah, that makes sense. It's not just power, but speed also. So we can go faster than hydraulics up to 2x. Nice. Uh, And so that's exciting. So you get just a lot more throughput. And the same amount of force? Uh... No, because you, you have to apply more force to get the acceleration for any particular kind of mass. But yeah. just inherently, we're not constrained by um, viscous fluids moving through small holes, right? Yeah. Where it's just, you can move belts really quickly. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so that's, so one is, you know, utilization. And then the other one is the cost of maintenance or downtime. Um, so there's plan maintenance, which has costs, and you have to do that with hydraulics. You've got to check stuff. Um, in our case, the only thing that can really wear uh, is the belt. And so with our uh, diagnostic systems, we can just inform the user it's time to change the belt, and then at some point we can say, okay, this belt is unusable. We're going to stop. Um, and so they can just change it. But they have plenty of warning before that happens. Well, and if you know, if you're preventative and you're in the realm of saying, hey, I think the belt's going to wear out in you know two to, two to five months, then you're golden because you just schedule preventative and you know it's when the machine's down anyway and, and you know, you're, you're a hero. And maybe you swap out another actuator fresh and then you send the other one back into the shop and do you know, a... Um, what is it? What's the word? You refurbish it, and then that has you know a second life. Exactly, and um, and so, I mean, if you think of uh, there are many production sectors like oil and gas, where if you have an actuator that's down, all of a sudden you're losing a million dollars a day, and so really cost is not not a concern at all. It's you know is this system dependable, and before it breaks, do I know so I can take proactive action action at the next maintenance cycle and we offer all of that that's awesome that's that's these are i mean the more and more i've learned about these actuators the more and more excited i get because the potential is so huge yeah no same here with with our design i mean i think ours has the potential to be cheaper out of the gate which is interesting i mean you've seen it it's open frame and so and it's it's very very it's just dead nuts simple and so it is if you go certain directions with it, like if we go, you know, for like an injection molded version, it's got the promise of just being stupid and expensive. But, you know, I mean, it doesn't, it's not a direct drop in for hydraulics. So it's just different, but it's also very fast. So you've got that advantage still. It's much more efficient than hydraulics. So you've got that advantage still. You don't need a radiator and all that infrastructure. So you've got that advantage still. So back to kind of uh, the tension dynamics actuators. I mean, they could be in consumer products right out the gate. Which yeah, we were that. thinking about that. So the, the one thing that came to mind is, you know, maybe you put it into gaming, right? So if you build a steward platform out of these things and, you know, you injection mold them. So, you know, it's like a $10, $20 actuator plus the cost of the motor and you make like a, a gaming chair that can gimbal. And because we've got that really good extended to compressed ratio, if you put it in the steward platform, you can imagine you can get angles like close to 90 degrees on like a flight simulator or like, you know, a gaming chair, which, you know, there might that might cause different liability concerns for, you know, like if you're going to put that in someone's home, that might be somewhat problematic because you don't have, you know, professionals around to to babysit the usage. So maybe it gets relegated to like amusement parks or like centers where they've got, you know, certain 
you know, like just, you know, safety officers effectively, you know, to, to police the usage and make sure nobody's, you know, defeating the safety mechanisms or misusing it. And they've got their own reasons for doing that and insurance policies and stuff like that. But it's exciting. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with it that are that are lower cost. And I mean, if you downpower it more than that, you know, you can look at, um, you know, kind of mi more micro applications. Like one example is just like grabbing things and moving them around and, you know, picking and, and factory applications. So that's something we're thinking about. If you put like three or six of these together on, you know, like a head and, and use that to, to move a manipulator just because of the low cost factor, that could be another use for it. The space application is interesting. So Vectrin is uh, radiation hard. Um, it's good up to 250 centigrade uh, working temperature, I believe. You can buy it off the shelf for, um, you know, 45 ton breaking strength. And so you can get pretty wow. big with it. Yeah, it's and, and it's awesome. And I mean, it's relatively inexpensive. It's just rope. I mean, it's it's a special right. kind of rope, you know, but it's, it's still yeah. rope at the end of the day. And so... Um, you know, we're really excited about just a plethora of applications and our, you know, I, I don't know if I should call him our CTO, but my co-founder who probably will become CTO and we all give ourselves titles is, uh, his name's Jason Equinomo. I had him on the podcast already and, and he's just brilliant. So he's, he's actually done some work with composites and, you know, has built some really high quality carbon fiber goods. And so if we decide to go the weight reduced route, I mean, we've got, you know, somebody that knows how to build that stuff, you know, right out of the gate you know, on the team. So, really excited. Fascinating stuff. Um, yeah, we're, I mean, as I was thinking about arms, I was thinking, does Rise have a place in arms? And yeah, when they get big, uh, where you can't actually put a motor on the joints, then Rise actually going to start to make sense. But in the small sizes, I think uh, it's pretty much, at least where we would go in, it's pretty much a solved problem. They just put a motor on a joint and then they're done with it. Yeah. Uh, have you seen the uh, the giant like the like the fanic arms that move five thousand pounds? I have not. There was some ridiculously large number after the fanic, you know, naming convention. But it was it was this arm that could move like cars basically, like complete entire, you know, like pickup trucks and like they're they're wild. And so like for something like that, I mean, maybe there's some some access that would make sense to automate or if you went like the Stuart platform route, you know, like that could make sense. I don't know. I, I, I think, though, that Rise's real niche is, like you said, it's an electrification of traditionally hydraulic vehicles. Like, that's that's where your design shines above ours and, and is the better fit for the job, in my opinion. Yeah, so going back to garbage trucks, for example, um, garbage trucks would be a would – st despite the low utilization, uh, it when, – when, so when you say low utilization, yes, when you talk about – uh, over 24 hours, the utilization is low, but it's, that actuator is working every stop, right? So in that sense, it does have very high utilization. Um, we would be, I think we can make an impact because a lot of garbage trucks are going electric. And so uh, the hydraulic system is super inefficient and it's actually going to drive the cost of the electric system because it's going to drive the battery cost. Yeah, that so, makes sense. And to be fair, I haven't looked at the duty cycles on those things and, and you know, like how much they're moving every day. Like You might start to see a cost savings there. That's right. Um, and then as far as arms go, we actually have an arm in our lab right now that can lift 7,000 pounds. And this is at, uh, I think uh, it's, a seven, it's seven foot away. So it's seven feet long, and it can lift uh, yeah, 7,000 pounds. That's incredible. awesome. Yeah, that's more than the Fanic arm. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to be lifting a car or truck with it at some point. It'll be on LinkedIn. That's cool. That that'll be a great. That'll be a great demo. I'm excited to see it. So, how much force can your cylinders generate, like off the shelf? Yes, so right now we have two bookends. We have our small, but not our well, not what we think is going to be our smallest cylinder. But our small cylinder can lift uh, two tons, and our let's say medium cylinder can lift 22 tons and we think we can go all the way up to 80. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. Hey, just very impressive numbers. Yeah. The, when I saw the large cylinder, I was like, Oh, this is a big beast. I mean, it, uh, we were initially building it. Uh, we know we can go up to 10 meters stroke length, but in the particular instance that we have that we can test in our shop, um, in our lab, is five meter stroke length. And so it's uh, at full extension, it's 10 meters. And any more than that, and we put a hole through our ceiling. 
I mean, that's still a pretty massive cylinder. Like, I don't think I've ever been around a hydraulic cylinder that, that was that was that large. <laughs> yeah, it's intended for container handlers. Awesome. So you're going to be taking something off a, a ship, and uh, you need that extension to get all the way to the, I think they stack them four high and eight high. So getting to four high on top of a ship, got to be pretty tall. So you're actually displacing a hydraulic cylinder that's used in the incumbent container handler, it sounds like. That's right. Yeah. And it's not just that. I mean, we're looking at a whole bunch of other heavy applications. Uh, again, this thing has a high utilization, right? So you're using them almost all of the time. And uh, you need the efficiency. Uh, you need the productivity. If it goes faster, you can get more throughput, right? So it's just, uh, and the cost of failure is used as a big backlog. So we're just a perfect fit for those sorts of applications. Anything mission critical, really, right? I mean, it just makes sense to have our cylinders because you'll know before anything happens to your mission and you yep. can take action. That's awesome. Well, yeah, and I mean, bringing up the preventative too, I mean, that the predictive, that's huge. I mean, like you said, you know, like you said. I mean, it sounds like, yeah, you're going to know before you have a failure, so it's safer. I mean, you know, weird confounding, you know, like it getting hit with a piece of shrapnel or whatever aside, you know, you're, it's an awesome design. Yeah, we're working on some other innovations that even if it were hit with a piece of shrapnel, it'll be fine from a safety perspective. Uh, may, you may not be able to do your mission. You might not be able to predict what happened, but at least the actuator will respond in a way that you expect. Meaning just stops where it's at. Yeah, stops exactly where it's at. That's pretty uh, cool. So, looking forward to. I don't think hydraulics do that. Um, well, it depends on the configuration, right? So you could lose pressure in a pipe and just have a valve click on and just hold the pressure in the cylinder. So that's one way to stop a hydraulic cylinder from moving. But then if there's a hole in the cylinder, yeah, you can't. And that would be the equivalent of a hole in the belt. And so. Uh, we're looking at ways to not have that be an issue. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we're exploring the same thing, but probably different methods. Now, isn't it fun to like be on a team of geniuses, like people that are smarter than you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's exhilarating for sure. I mean, I, I think, I know, what's that cliche about like, you know, like good managers seek out people smarter than them, bad managers want to be the smartest one or whatever. And so I think it's... um. Yeah, for me, I, I enjoy that, too, because I know I'm not going to be the best at everything, and, and I want people that are smarter than me on my team. Yeah, this is a good segue. I'd like to talk about this for a second. Um, I had a mentor that told me that uh, if you're a bad manager, you are the organization's ceiling. <laughs> yeah, I like that. And if you're a good manager, then you set it up so that the organization lifts you up as you add the talent and you unlock the talent and you unblock them and you help them sort of get to 100% of their potential. Um, and actually I see that in the Olympics. Like when I look at how you know the U S is competing, it's, it's like we're doing a lot to make these athletes get to 100% of their potential. Um, and I think just like any organization, whether it's a company, or it's the country, if you can just unlock the talent that you have and get them to perform at their best, it just, you'd be unstoppable. Um, there's so many bureaucracies in other nations that I've visited and heard about where you're not able to get everyone to operate there because um, there's an infrastructure, there's an education, there's in communication, um, there are opportunities, um, there's a lot of bureaucracy and red tape slowing down people. Um, so just getting rid of all of that, just just huge. Um, the other thing I heard, this is, I think, a quote from Guy Kawasaki. He's a very entertaining guy. If you haven't read, seen some of his slide I've read decks. the art of the start. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's about pretty as cool. far as I yeah. got into him. Um, and he's, he's, also, he's such a great speaker. Um, if I could be one-tenth the speaker that he is, I'd just be thrilled. Um, so he says, uh, I'm paraphrasing from memory, A players hire A plus players. B players hire C players. Right? And so if I want to be if I want to look in the mirror and consider myself an A player, I have to go hire people that are smarter than me. Yeah, so I guess 
as we kind of near, near the end of the episode and, and both of us want to get to bed, um, what do you see next for Rise and um, what are you excited for on the horizon? Yeah, so one of the key elements of my strategy has been to focus our efforts on things that we can get to market faster, right? I want uh, us to have product that's out in the field. Uh, I want us to start to show traction and growth. Um, so I'm sort of looking mainly at that. And as part of that, uh, we're going to need more money than we have in the bank. And so I'm looking at different ways to augment our cash reserves and extend them. One of the things I'm exploring is crowdfunding. Um, I've had a couple of friends that have had a fair amount of success with that. And to me, it seems like it's an easy way to bridge from where we are to where I need to get to, to get a, a large institutional investor that buys into the vision, can actually see the traction, right? And they can they realize that they'll be coming in right at the beginning of that hockey stick. So that's what I'm trying to do is get that hockey stick started. Um, and as part of that, I'm going to be looking at uh, crowdfunding and other ways to raise funds. But How can people participate if they're listening to this and they want to get involved? Yeah, actually, that's what triggered it is that, you know, a lot of the vendors we deal with locally and people that we've dealt with uh, just in around and when they hear about what Rise is doing and they see the patent and they see how cool the tech is and they look at the videos, they're like, this is really unique and I want to be a part of this. And so that's what got me sort of thinking, well, there are all these other stakeholders that want to participate and... Uh, up until Reg CF was passed, they had no way to do it. And now there is this instrument, so why not make use of it? But I mean, like if somebody listening wants to buy shares and rise, like is there a Kickstarter? Is there a website? Um, what's what's the best way for people to take action and, and you know get involved directly? I think we'll be making some sort of announcement. I have to figure out what the legalities are. We'll probably post it in our blog. Um, and then I'll probably be doing the rounds on other podcasts talking about it cool. uh, once we're ready. Um, but there's a fair amount of work, and I'm coming up to speed, uh, talking to folks, making sure that it's the right thing for us, um, which I think it is. I've spent a fair amount of time. I've had the right conversations with the board, getting everyone aligned. So that looks like it might be in our near future. Awesome. Anything else you want to plug on your way out? <laughs> Um, this is an awesome podcast. So thank you. If you listen to it and you like it, and you've got something to offer, Spencer is awesome. Come join his podcast. Thanks, Hitan. You're awesome. <laughs> I, you. I appreciate you coming on, brother. Uh, I guess we'll cut it there. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Kraus is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Thanks again and see you on the next one.